Again, congratulations, and just enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. It's fun to see all the new parents getting certified. It means you might be here a while. I'm excited about that. <laughs> we're also excited and aware, we're aware of the accomplishment that you've done, but we're also very aware of the mantle of responsibility that you've assumed in receiving this certif certification. Our first core value is diversity and inclusion, which we demonstrate, we hope, through cultural, cultural humility, attentiveness, and collegiality. As we celebrate this afternoon, we cannot help but reflect on the fact that we are within a few miles of the southern border of the US, perhaps one of the most contentious regions in the country right now. If we are to live into the values of diversity and inclusion, we cannot ignore where we are. And with that knowledge, we must also act to make that value real in our practice with students, in our centers, and in our communities. And I would add, in our very hearts. Because of where we are and because of who we are, it gives me great pleasure to welcome as our commencement speaker, Professor Miguel de la Torre, Professor of Latinx Studies and Social Ethics at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. While I trust that you have read about Dr. de la Torre's work, in our conference materials, I'm most excited that he is with us as a living example of one who not only advocates for diversity and inclusion, but lives it. He argues for an ethic of place, a commitment that is so familiar to those of us who teach students the action reflection model, which is always rooted in context, both that of the students and the places where we serve. Please join me in welcoming the scholar, activist, prophet, and visionary, Miguel de la Torre. Thank you so much for the invitation. Buenas tardes. And felicidades to all the graduates. I mean, to ask for a commencement speaker at a moment like this, I know you're expecting someone to, to, to give a very hopeful message, one that tells you that you could accomplish anything, one that tells you to just go forward and change the world. You got the wrong person. <laughs> Instead, I'm gonna to try to tell you how hopeless it is. And if we could just embrace that hopelessness, maybe we might be able to make a difference. As a young boy, um, I was probably, I, I would argue that my family was the first to move into Jackson Heights as a Latino family. I can't prove that. But I can prove that I was the first Latino to attend Blessed Sacrament Elementary School in Jackson Heights. I also have the honor of being left back in first grade because I never spoke. So the nuns thought that there was something wrong with me and they sent me to Bellevue where they did a whole bunch of exams, um, one including electricity for some reason. What they discovered was that the reason I did not speak is because I couldn't speak English. I didn't know the language. Now, a lot has changed since those days. Um, but some things have remained the same. Latinx are still the other. Our religious practices aren't understood many times by caregivers. We still have a major problem with the undocumented and sometimes we refuse to deal with the hopelessness of the situation. So I'm hoping, no pun intended, to deal with these four issues. First of all, we are still the others in the medical um, and pastoral profession. From 1946 to 1948, US doctors, US health officials, the Surgeon General at the time, Thomas Perrin, all together conspired to infect 1,300 Guatemalans with venereal diseases to learn how to control SDD. These victims, unbeknownst to them of the injections that they received, went ahead and infected their spouses and children. And this was not uncovered until 2010. In June 1990, 1,500 six-month-old black and Latinx kids, um, six months old in Los Angeles, were given an experimental measles vaccine developed by Kaiser Permanente. 
And the parents were never informed of this. And, and the same vaccine, when it was tried out in, um, in third world nations, had devastating effects. In 2009, Pfizer settled a 75 million settlement with a testing of an antibiotic in, Ni in Nigeria without telling the parents that they were giving this to their children. So, so I want to begin by hopefully expressing to you why I don't trust doctors or professionals or caregivers. And I can't speak for all Latinos, obviously. I don't want to essentialize. But I believe that this statement might resonate with a lot of communities of color, that there's a certain distrust that people of color who have suffered in the hands of the establishment automatically have. So I want to begin by challenging you. It's how do you overcome my distrust? How do you get me to actually trust you? One way is to recognizing that our spiritual care is somewhat different than the normative care. I'll give you an example. Um, I always say that I am a Roman Catholic, Southern Baptist, Santero. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that I'm confused. What it means is that for many of us from the Caribbean, we have known how to be part of different faith traditions at the same time and find absolutely no contradiction in the contradictory doctrines of those traditions. So if you walk into my office, I have my Vinje de Cobre, which no good Southern Baptist should ever have a, 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 a train. And I have next to it a statue to Ochun, even though El Egua is my head, but that's a different story. The point I'm getting at is, even though these faith traditions are contradictory, they come together in my very essence and my very being. So if I need counseling, if I need help, not to recognize how this works could be highly problematic. See, I understand in the Eurocentric world, you're either a Catholic or a Protestant. You can't be both. You're either a Buddhist or you're Muslim. You can't be both. But in my world, there's a certain fluidity to our spirituality. Okay. And it doesn't mean that we're wrong or confused or we, have, you know, we, we, just, we don't know the truth. It just means that we're more complex and we're more open to, to, to the different things that we don't understand. That is beyond us. So the question is, will you take the time to understand our traditions? And, and that's one step towards this trust that I'm talking about. The other third item, before we get into the main conversation, is the undocumented. I'm not going to discuss at, at right now about the crisis in itself. I'm not going to talk about how every four days, five brown bodies die in the desert, uh, which probably makes this the greatest human rights violation occurring in this country at this time, which is not part of the discourse when we talk about immigration. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about how many human rights organizations, legal scholars, and the United Nations has meticulously um, um, documented the grave abuses that go on when individuals are, are picked up on the border and put into detention centers. I'm not going to talk about that either. Instead, what I want to talk about is how, when the undocumented are picked up at the border, the lack of medical care and the lack of counseling that they received. We are separating children, from, at times from nursing mothers, and putting them in cages. I can't even begin to imagine the psychological damage that these children are going to have as they enter into the adolescent years and into adulthood. I can't begin to imagine these, uh, over, uh, this year alone, over 700 of children are, are placed in cages. So with this happening right now, I would argue that the situation is truly hopeless. 
And I really want to pause on that for a moment. Because to say it's all going to work out, it's not going to work out for these children. The damage is already done. And, and to think that somehow we're going to get beyond this, we may, we may not. But for these children, they need the care now. So I want to talk about this embracing hopelessness. I took a group of students to Guernavaca, Mexico, to learn from the poor about, um, about their poverty and how our privilege in the first world is interconnected with their poverty in the two third worlds. We went to um, La Estacion, which is a part of uh, Guernavaca where people have built um, shacks, it's, 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 you know, shacks of which to live in, made out of cardboard and tin and wood. And that evening, as we were unpacking what we saw, one of my students said, you know, that's horrible, what they're going through. But when I looked into the eyes of the little girls, I saw the hope in their eyes. At that moment, I had an epistemological meltdown. <laughs> because what I responded was, I'm not sure what you saw in their eyes, but within seven to eight years, they're going to be turning tricks to put food on the table or be stuck in an abusive marriage. There is no hope for that little girl. And I began to wonder if hope is but a middle class privilege that allows us not to deal with the hopelessness of the oppressed and the disenfranchised of the world. And when we place our hope upon the disenfranchised, are we doing extreme violence to them? I began to wrestle with that. This was like 10 years ago, and only recently have I begun to actually try to theoretically understand that proposition. And I know what I'm saying goes against the grain of Christian thought, because after all, what are the gifts of the Spirit? Um, love, joy, peace, and hope, and I'm saying not so fast on the hope. All things don't work out for good by those who are called by God for God's purposes. I, I know I'm going against what Romans 8.28 says. I, I know that. But the reality of what I witness when I'm in place, when I'm with people, does not show that to be true. And if I'm going to counsel them, if I'm going to minister to them, if I'm going to bring a message of liberation, then I have to sit with them in that hopelessness. Amen. See, we are in such a hurry to get to Easter, those of us who are Christians, <laughs> that we forget about Holy Saturday, where the vast majority of my people live. And if I'm going to be in radical solidarity with the oppressed of the world, I have to sit in the Saturday of the moment and not be looking towards the Easter. Easter may come, but it's not coming yet. And to somehow tell them, oh, don't worry, it's all going to work out, besides sounding disingenuous, at the same time, frees me from any responsibility to remain sitting with the oppressed. Now, the reason, well, in Spanish, see, the problem is that I'm thinking in Spanish. In Spanish, hope is esperanza, from where we get the word esperar, which means to wait. See, when I say hope, I'm talking about waiting. And I'm never quite sure what I'm waiting for. <laughs> and I'm never quite sure if what I'm waiting for is going to be better. And there is that ambiguity in the word esperanza that does not appear in the English word hope, which is why you all really need to learn Spanish. Because <laughs> when you get to heaven, if you don't know Spanish, you're in trouble. <laughs> now, I'm sure you all heard some pastor give the sermon of the little girl, in the, you know, after a big storm, there's a little girl in the beach uh, throwing all the starfishes back in the beach. 
and there's a grumpy old man there saying, you can't save them all. And she picks up just one and says, well, I'll save this one and throws it back in. Okay, I'm the grumpy old man. <laughs> and the reason being, what we have done with hope is that we have personalized it to the individual one. So yes, I got out of the barrio. I got a PhD. I made it. There is hope in the world. Put me on a pedestal. But do you know how many of my compatriots did not make it out of the barrio and are now six feet under? Just because one starfish makes it does not erase the thousands of rotting flesh on the beach whose, whose stench has choked all the hope out of my nostrils. If I'm going to be in radical solidarity, I must be in radical solidarity, not with the one that makes it, but with the thousands that is left behind on the beach, dying and rotting. The, e the, the irreducibility to the personal is what makes hope work. And here's where I think Hegel got it all wrong. And, and I have nothing against Hegel and other German um, philosophers and theologians, but, 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 but in this case, I do. See, for Hegel, he gives us a dialectical movement of time, right? And where time keeps moving in an upward progression towards something better. From where we get our salvation history, you know, that you know, things are bad, but it's going to get better, we're all going to get to heaven. Um, and it's not just religious. Economics has a salvation history, whether it be capitalism, that, you know, with capitalism, everybody's going to get richer and richer, and all the, you know, the rising tide will lift all boats. Or with Marxism, you know, we're going to wither away the state until one day we all get to, a, to, the, to the paradise where everything's going to work. So, so, so part of our DNA has the salvation history of a movement of time, that time is interlocked and moving forward to something better. Unfortunately, I drank the Foucault Kool-Aid. <laughs> and instead, I'm arguing that time is not, only, it's, it's, it's not linear, and it's disjointed, and it's not connected. Time is just chaos. And, and what we do, it's kind of like every once in a while, Jesus appears in a tortilla someplace, OK? <laughs> See. Our brains are geared to look at chaos and find order in the chaos. Uh, a study was done in South Korea in where they showed people static images, and they said there's a face in that static images, and people saw the face. And, and you do the same thing. You know, sometimes you look at something and say, oh, I could see a face there. You know, it's Jesus, yay. But, 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 but our brains are, are designed to look for order in the disorder. And what I'm arguing is that what we have done with dialectical movement of history is that in the disorder of time, we are seeing the face of Jesus and putting time in that disorder. And this is important because then we could feel good about ourselves. Because if everything is, has an order and a purpose, then I don't have to worry about all the horrible things that's going on because it's all going to work out anyway. See, and Moltmann picks this up. And his whole theology of hope is based on this promise that at the end, God keeps God's promises. But unfortunately, God does not necessarily keep God's promises. As Primo Levi said, there is no God, only Auschwitz. You know, and the trial of God in the camps of Auschwitz was a trial that God failed to keep God's promise to God's chosen people. So either God is not keeping God's promises or, God, or God's chosen people have become the murderers of those who were the chosen in the past, which, which, which becomes problematic to say the least. So, the idea, you know, the idea that God keeps God's promises when history does not show that, um, we have to then force history to prove me wrong. And I think that is what Hegel does in, in his whole theory. But like I said, 
I, I don't necessarily buy it. Um, I love MLK. I love the work he did. But when he said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, I disagree. I think the arc of the moral universe could care less and could bend as much towards justice as to injustice. And if it's going to bend towards justice, we're the one that have to do the bending. <laughs> Vanities of vanities, says the teacher, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless. Ezekiel, um, Ecclesiastics 1.1. 1, 1. And here's something I think that my Jewish friends and brothers and sisters has taught me. There is a certain darkness, a dark side to God. This is a God who was absent when Jesus is being crucified. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, good theologians, what we end up doing is that we go ahead and say, oh, no, no, God was there, but God can't look upon sin. And because God can't look at sin, God couldn't look at Jesus at that moment. And that sounds nice for a Sunday school class. But, but really? <laughs> we have a God who can't look at sin? Because if that's the case, God can't see anything any day of the, day of the week. <laughs> I mean, man. So that's not a good answer. Jesus, at the moment of death, was hopelessly forsaken. And see, that encourages me, because I know that I, too, when I am hopelessly forsaken, am not alone, because Jesus understands that pain. This is a God that is somewhat sadistic. Have you read Job lately? I mean, God and Satan are gambling. I bet you that I could make Job curse you. And God says, I'll take that bet, you know. And they destroy his life. And then at the end, Job is begging, why, oh God, why did this happen? And what is God's response? It's none of your business. I'm God. I do whatever the hell I want. I find that problematic. But yet, it's in the book for me to wrestle with. Realizing I don't have the answer, I just have the wrestling to do. And like Jacob, many times I walk away limping and in pain when I do this kind of wrestling. So here's where Miguel de Unamuno really helps me out. Miguel de Unamuno, the philosopher, basically argues I cannot prove the existence of God. It just cannot be proven. You can't use reason or anything to prove God. At the same token, you cannot disprove the existence of God. To believe in God or not to believe in God is what we call faith. It can't be proven. And then he says, you might as well believe. You know, there's more benefit to that than not believing. And, and I like that. So, so I, I believe in the God that I'm not sure even exists. Okay. And in that, I can then understand the hopelessness of the situation and that it's not, it may not all work out in the end. We could have a couple of centuries of a renewed neo-slavery. We could have a new genocide. You know, just the other day, I was reading a newspaper that one of the militia says, we need to round up all these immigrants and put them in gas chambers. See, that scares I, I am more afraid now as a Latino in this country than I've ever been. And I've been in this country for now 60 years. I'm more afraid now occupying this, this, this body. So. Is everybody happy now? <laughs> so what do you do? What becomes the ethical response in a hopeless situation, in a world where evil usually wins? 
How do we deal with that? In some of my work, I have developed what I call an ethics para joren. Yeah, I can could, I could tell what the Spanish people are. <laughs> so let me translate that, if I may. To joren is a certain English word that is four letters long. It begins with F <laughs> and ends with K. See, I only curse in Spanish. Nothing personal. English just don't know how to, you just don't know how to curse properly. So. And here's my argument. When you are standing before the hopelessness we call neoliberalism, when you're standing before embedded racism and sexism and heterosexism, when after centuries nothing really has changed, the only ethical response is to overturn the table and screw with the system. No, I didn't say screw the system. I said screw with the system. And, and I'm getting this. Remember when, earlier when I said I was a Roman Catholic, Southern Baptist, Santero? I'm getting this from the Santero part. <laughs> because my orisha is elegua. And elegua is the trickster. Okay? And the trickster creates chaos in order. We have developed into a society where we have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests. So yeah, I mean, we're the only nation that, we're the only people that could drive to a march. And after we drive to a march, we feel good about ourselves. We did something. We carried a sign. We yelled down with the man. And, you know, we wore those funny hats, which, by the way, those are women, white women's hats, because that's not, you know, you know that, okay. That's not the color of, yeah, okay. So, so we feel good about ourselves, okay? We did all this protest stuff, okay? And nothing changes, but we did something. And, 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 you know, I always love, I, I teach at a very liberal school, and, and I love my liberal students, but once in a while, they come, they, they, they come to me once in a while and say, oh, Dr. Latoya, we're all going to go get arrested. Why don't you join us? And I'm like, I'm a Latino. I don't have to go get arrested. <laughs> it just comes natural. You guys go get arrested. <laughs> but you see, if I get arrested, that's my liberal credential that I did something, and nothing changes. Okay. So, in a, in a social structure that is designed not to change anything, but provides us a space where we can yell and scream and feel good about ourselves, the only ethical response, the only ethical imperative is to screw with the system, create chaos, in the hope that new opportunities might arise. This is why Immanuel Kant does not work for Latinos. Because we, are, we have a different structure imposed upon us. Now, I learned this not because, you know, this is not, I'm not making, by the way, this is not something that I just came up with and I invented. It really is not. This is what the oppressed of the world have always done. I'm just giving it words within my culture. I mean, African Americans could talk about bear rabbit and, and bear bear and, 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 and how you had to act um, um, you know, lazy as a slave, so even if it gets you the nickname of being shiftless, but because it saved you from having to work and kill yourself for the master. And even while the master says, thou shall not steal, 
So you can't steal the master's chicken. You still did it because the master stole your body. So you don't follow the morality and the rules and the ethics of those who have created it to keep you oppressed. I have no moral obligation to follow rules or laws that are designed to keep me oppressed. Period. So I'm not inventing anything new. And, and, and the way I learned about this, the way I developed this, besides the Cuernavaca trip, is that I began to look at the young lords. Now, the young lords were, began as a turf gang in uh, Chicago and in New York. And, and what the young lords did, you know, they, 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 at first they were just protecting their territory, but then they got revolutionized. They started reading books. I mean, that's always a dangerous thing. And, and what they did, I'll give you a couple of examples. In, in New York, in, my, in the area I grew up in, back in the late 60s, um, the sanitation department would pick up garbage whenever they felt like it. In, in, in communities of color, not in white communities, they picked it up on Mondays and Wednesdays. So, so in, in, in our communities, they just picked it up whenever they wanted. So the young lords went ahead and they, they swept the streets, they put all the garbage in bags, they put it on the corner, they called the sanitation department and they said, we cleaned our streets, can you please come and get all the garbage to you know, put it in proper bags? And the sanitation department laughed at them and said, yeah, sure, we'll get there whenever we want to. So they took all those bags, they went to Third Avenue in Manhattan doing rush hour traffic, they built a wall, and they set it on fire. The cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail. But it's, it, it, it stopped traffic, literally. But more importantly, now New York Times started doing articles about the sanitation department and how come they had to do this act. And now, in, in, in Spanish Harlem, they pick up the garbage on Mondays and Thursdays. Okay. You see, by screwing with the systems, you developed, you raised the consciousness of a community, <coughs> excuse me, so as to bring about change. Now, my favorite thing that the young lords did was in the first week of December, I think it was 68 or 69, they went to um, La Primera Iglesia Metodorita, and they asked the pastor, can we go ahead and please have um, a food closet, a clothes closet, um, have some maybe legal help for our members you know, of the community? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting all choked up. Um, you know, I have legal help and and, and, and also some classes on culture pride. And the pastor looked at them and says, ah, you little Satans, Satanas, get out of here. So they showed up the next week doing Sunday service. And they picked up the pastor and they threw him out. <laughs> and they nailed a, um, a sign to the door saying, um, La Iglesia de la Gente, the people's church. And they began to provide breakfast, and they began food closets. And they did this for like about three weeks until the cops came and you know, arrested them and kicked them out. But for three weeks, that was truly the people's church. See, when I'm talking about screen with the system, what I'm talking about specifically is how, what, act, what practices, what acts do we accomplish, do we do, that holds people with their, to the rhetoric that they expound. What do we do to show the hypocrisy of their rhetoric and force them to live up to their rhetoric? Okay. Now, I got this also from working at the border um, in where there is this understanding of, co um, this understanding of action called um, civil initiative. Okay. When, Norbert, when, Nor when the sanctuary movement began in the 1980s, some of its leaders, um, specifically John Fife, kept doing interviews talking about uh, we're doing civil disobedience, copying the civil rights movement. But then he was held accountable for that. And he's telling me the story. So, uh, and, and he says that people started calling him because what they were doing, which, and by the way, if you remember the sanctuary movement, they were taking in people into the church and providing them sanctuary uh, from the, um, because they were trying to escape the death squads in Latin America that we were sponsoring. 
And his argument was, uh, he was told that, that this is not civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is when you break a bad law in order to change the law. Okay? But see, we had good laws, and we still have good laws about immigration. The laws are that any, you know, going back to the Nuremberg trial, that anyone who escapes persecution from a country must be taken in. The people who were doing the civil disobedience was the US government. They were the one breaking the laws. So the work of sanctuary movement was to force the government to recognize that they were not living up to the laws that they swore to abide and the treaties that they agreed to abide to. So civil initiative, as opposed to civil disobedience, is how do I act to hold governments and parties and churches and associations accountable to the rhetoric that they say that they believe in. Okay. So, so this ethics para joder is a way, it's really a civil initiative movement, not a civil disobedience movement. Now, if you embrace this hopelessness, here's what I think will happen. <clears throat> you all know this better than I do. People who do social work, how long do they usually last before they start selling real estate? <laughs> I mean, very short life expectancy, right? I would argue that the reason for that is because they really think they're going to change the world. And then after year, year after year of the horrors of this world and they realize nothing has changed, instead some things have gotten worse, they get totally disillusioned and totally burnt out. But if we begin embracing the hopelessness, realizing I am not the savior, I am not the one that's going to change the world, I may not even change much, then I won't burn out or get disillusioned. I've been working with undocumented now for a good 20 years. And I do it not because I think I'm going to win. See, chances are I'm not going to win. And I have to pause for a second. <clears throat> do you do the work you do because you think you're going to win? Because you see, if you think you're going to win, that's the wrong reason for doing what you're doing. You know. I do what I do because it defines my very humanity and my very faith, regardless of the outcome. See, once you think you're going to win, everyone joins the bandwagon. You know, once something's going to happen and it's going to be good, everyone's all of a sudden for it and everyone's pushing for it and yay. But when no one is in agreement with you and you're doing it because it's the right thing to do, then realizing that it doesn't matter if you win or lose, but that action is what defines you, then it's worth it. Then that sustains you. It sustains me. So, so, so embracing the hopelessness becomes really a form of self-preservation. And that's the paradox of all this, of what I'm saying, because I know it sounds counterintuitive, but. Once I realize it doesn't depend on me, then I am free to do what, you know, whatever needs to be done. And, and also, once I get the disenfranchised to also embrace the hopelessness of the situation, and tear away all this rhetoric that it's all going to work out. When they realize they have nothing to lose, that's when they become the most radical and the most dangerous. And if we really want to change the social structures, we need that point of radicalism. And we'll never get to that point of radicalism as long as I think I have something to lose because I'll be too busy protecting the little that I think I have. So to embrace hopelessness, I would argue, 
is a liberating act that could propel us to praxis. And to Horeb, I am following my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who overturned the temples and was probably the greatest Horeron of all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that word. And I think you might have a little bit of Buddhism mixed in there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> that sort of radical acceptance um, that I really have to agree with. Um, we have time for questions. So um, if you're willing to stay up here, we'll let people um, just pop up and see what they want to ask. Uh, I really like what you had to say. I'm interested in hearing you say something uh, about the distance between hope and perhaps optimism because the way you spoke of hope, it felt like it's more of an optimistic idea for me versus something else. Yeah. No, thank you. And, and, and definitely a lot of what I say could easily apply to optimism. But I want to hold on to the word hope. And the reason I want to hold on to it is because hope assumes that you know, because there is this dialectical history, that at the end of this history, we're going to be able to look back and see how it all worked out in the end. That somehow God's hand was still in all this. And, and I cannot for the life of me, be able to say that the period of slavery or the period of the Holocaust or the period of the Inquisitions was somehow God's plan moving us to this final point. So I really am questioning how history is constructed. And once I deconstruct how we've always understood history, that eliminates this idea that at the end of history there is this hope. Okay. Now, like Unamuno, there very well could be, and if there is, not a problem. I got my fire insurance. You know, I walked down the aisle at the Southern Baptist Church, so I'm cool. <laughs> but even if there isn't, that's still OK, because my acts do not depend on some future reward. So that's why I want to hold on, I, I, I want to, hold on to the word hope and not just say, I'm just talking about optimism. I'm also talking about this gift of the spirit, hope. Thank you very much, I too love what you said. Um, one thing I've learned from my black and brown brothers and sisters is the tendency towards despair in living year after year over a lifetime with the kinds of uh, challenges I don't face myself, but um, I hear about and try to uh, join them in. And, uh, Cornell West writes about that too. And you seem to, to distinguish between hopelessness and despair. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can comment on how we can embrace hopelessness right. without sinking into despair. Yeah. The person who defines hopelessness as despair is um, Jürgen Mutmann. He's the one that says to be hopeless is to be in despair. I think he is wrong. Because despair means that I rode up in a fetal position and I gnash my teeth and I cry. The opposite of hope is not despair. The opposite of hope is desperation. And there's a radical difference in that because desperation, meaning that I have, if I stay, my children are going to be killed by gangs so or I'm going to die. If I try to cross that desert, I very well may die as well. But desperation forces me to get up and cross that desert knowing that I may still die. 
Desperation propels me to radical action. To be in desperation means I do something out of desperation. So, so I, I really make a, a very strong case that when I'm talking about hope, the opposite is not despair, it is desperation. And that's why I'm trying to get people to recognize their desperation. <laughs> I'm a recently retired educator, and I think as I listen to you, I think about over the decades, the most often phrase I've heard students say in chaplaincy is, I want to give patients hope. And the challenge that I think I've had in hearing that is to help them explore their options. And so I can remember coming up with perhaps the trite phrase of, well, maybe you never have to give up hope. Sometimes you have to change what you're hoping for. But this concept of just sitting with people in their hopelessness is, I think, a renewed appreciation and that it doesn't have to be a place of despair. Right. So thank you. I'm excited about the fact that you talked about how um, we don't go from hopelessness into despair and that it's desperation, because I've been a desperate woman for a long time, and it has moved me to act yeah. and get through so many adverse situations. And so I find that that shifting in the paradigm is very energizing and liberating for me, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. No, I really argue that hopelessness is very liberating. It really is when we embrace it. Thank you very much. Uh, as I told you, I enjoy all of your books. You had me thinking about Howard Thurman's Three Hounds of Hell, Hatred, Fear, and Deception. And so if you could speak a little more to the tenets that drive the hopelessness into that liberation. When you say the tenets, help me understand the question better. Similar to Howard Thurman mm -hmm. and the way he uses, the way right. he talks about as African Americans using hatred mm -hmm. in a system, using the power of deception, because that when I hear that, I hear the parallel of needing to mess with the system mm -hmm. in order to help change the system, whatever right. that system of oppression looks like. And when I heard you speaking, it reminded me of that. And so I was wondering, as, as a person who has lived in those places of hopelessness, um, I still kind of do because I work in a psychiatric system, uh, inpatient, mental health, and the majority, 80s, it's shifted down, 80 to 85% being African American, not because that's the national statistic, but that's because that's where they put the sickest of the sick, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I sit with the hopelessness a lot, whether it be by choice, force, and grace. And so as I was hearing you, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, how do I, what, is, what does that look like for those that don't sit with it? Because it's hard to speak to and say, this is what it looks like, because I'm just, I just, I'm just used to sitting with it. Mm -hmm. So how do we speak to those who don't recognize the hopelessness is what I'm hearing. OK, I'm, okay thank you. Let me be very clear. My, objection, my objective is not to make everybody hopeless. OK? So, so I want to be very clear about that. I mean, you know, and I think I mentioned this this afternoon. I remember coming across a person crossing the desert saying, Oh, the virgin, you know, the virgin appeared to me and led me to where the water was and led me to, you know, to, to find this group that, that then saved my life. That's not the time for me to say, well, you understand in the hopeless situation of it all that still a lot of Latinos are dying crossing the desert and it just so happened that you were lucky and, you know, I don't go, I just say, oh, yes, Gloria La Vinha, this is so fantastic. That's not the time to have those conversations. Um, but 
when that same person begins to wrestle, why did they find water and the other people did not? That's when I begin to raise the consciousness. Pastorally, gently, you know, here, you know, I'm just saying it the way it is because we're, we're going to, but if I'm actually, you know, and I've preached on this, it's a different, you know, the message goes a lot slower to help, and, and I really believe that most people recognize how, how hopeless oppression is. And I just try to tap into that and, and, and let them know that it's okay to be hopeless, that it's not a sin, that it's okay if it doesn't work out as long as we create a community so, it, so we could be together in solidarity. So how do I pastorally raise that consciousness, okay, is what I think I'm trying to do, it, it, you know, as far as talking to people who, who just have the pat answers as to how it's all going to work out anyway in the midst that it's not, you know. Um, and, and sometimes I've told people, oh, you know, to say, oh, it's all going to work out, don't worry, you know, I, I've been praying, I go, that's great, I'm, I'm, I'm praying with you. But if it doesn't, okay, it's okay. That doesn't mean that, you know, that, that God abandoned you and hates you. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, so when, I, when, I, when, I, when I first um, began to, um, to explain this idea of hopelessness, one of the sections in that chapter um, is called pa uh, pastoral. And it really talks about, you know, the, the, the pastoral responsibility. And another section of it, maybe to answer your question as well, is um, comunidad, the community. In other words, when I decide to jorel, when I decide to screw with the system, it's not an individual act. It's not me deciding I'm gonna go ahead and do something. It's the people coming together as a community, wrestling with each other to decide what kind of action to do. Kind of like the um, Zapatistas, that they come together as community, decide what political acts they're gonna do as a people. So there's a communal element in this. It's, it can never be done individualistic because if it's done individualistic, I could do a lot of damage thinking that I'm somehow doing a great work for God. Okay. Um, when we talk about uh, hopelessness, I immediately thought about my uh, sister who um, uh, ended her life when she was at the end of hope. So when people lose their hope, they may either choose the uh, extreme measure like suicide mm -hmm. or uh, they may be able to rise above the um, uh, De devastating circumstance. Yeah. So uh, in terms of being with uh, those who are hopeless, I agree. I'm uh, completely uh, uh, by it for that. And on the other hand, uh, I'm wondering if we talk about the hopelessness, many people who are end of hope, uh, I'm deeply concerned about their choice. Mm -hmm. uh, they, may, they may not have much choice except extreme uh, case. Yeah. So uh, whenever we are talking about uh, hopelessness, that reminds me of that uh, danger of the hopelessness. So we, in my view, uh, I don't want to idolize the hopelessness because it has devastating, it can cause devastating, devastating result. So what do you think about the uh, limit yeah. uh, of uh, hopelessness when we talk about? No, thank you for sharing that. And, 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 and I, I'm sorry about your loss. And I think you're touching on something that's very crucial, a few things that are crucial. Number one, these are guideposts that I'm talking about, not absolute truths. I want to be very clear about that. This is how people who have been oppressed deal with these issues. Um, I would argue that for many people who already are hopeless, many times the response is something that's very damaging. 
turn to drugs, turn to alcohol, turn to suicide. And it was to turn to an act that is damaging to the individual. What I'm trying to do is for those who already are hopeless to explain these are not the ways you should be going. You shouldn't be doing these acts. Instead, how do we use this energy of hopelessness to create praxis that might change the structures that are creating the hopelessness? Because I also think that by telling, no, it's all, that there is hope, it's all going to work out, for many people, it comes to a point when that sounds very hollow. And then when it starts sounding really hollow, that's when those horrible acts could begin to take place. So I just want to be real with the hopelessness. And I want to be able to tell a person, your hopelessness does not mean that you're bad or that you're evil or that it just means that this is the way the structures are. Now, how do we, and this is why community is important, how do we work together for praxis that changes things? The reason I think that this works this way is because when I was writing the manuscript, one of my TAs was, was a gang member. And he got arrested again. And he went to prison. And with my permission, he took my manuscript to prison with him. And he did a Bible study on the manuscript <laughs> with other gang members. And he told me, you know what? They got it. They understood what you were saying. There was, no, there was none of these questions about trying to rec They understood their life is hopeless. And drugs and alcohol is the way you escape the hopelessness. And they began to talk about finding other ways to deal with this. How do they, how do, how do they raise their consciousness in a way that could be beneficial? So that's the kind of work I'm trying to do. And we'll see if it, you know, hopefully it, it, it might be effective, it may not. But, but I hear your concern, and I, want, and I don't want to dismiss that concern. That's a very real concern, because as we know, many people who are not so much in desperation but are in despair end up doing horrible things. And I want to change that despair to desperation so that they could do action instead. It seems to me that sometimes we conflate the word hope with meaning. So I think someone may be hopeless but not have a loss of meaning. And I wonder if that's a link between the question here and your response. Mm. Thank, thank you. you for your talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.